In this video, I want to talk about the fifth of Aquinas' five ways of proving God's existence. It's the way, he says, based on the governance of things. Most people think of it as a design argument, an early version of a teleological argument for the existence of God. The argument of design is developed extensively later by a variety of people, by William Paley, um, by various contemporary people defending a version of a fine-tuning or design argument. It was criticized very famously by David Hume in his dialogues concerning natural religion. I'm not sure that that's exactly what Aquinas is giving us, but it does seem as if it's some kind of design argument. In any case, let's take a look at what he says in the fifth way. The fifth way is taken from the governance of the world. We see that things which lack intelligence, such as natural bodies, act for an end. This is evident from their acting always, or nearly always, in the same way, to obtain the best result. Hence it's plain that not fortuitously, but designedly, do they achieve their end. Now whatever lacks intelligence cannot move toward an end unless it be directed by some being endowed with knowledge and intelligence, as the arrow is shot to its mark by the archer. Therefore some intelligent being exists by whom all natural things are directed to their end, and this being we call God. Let's tease apart the structure of that argument. First of all, things lacking intelligence act toward an end. They act in the same way to produce the best result. That I see it as the sub-argument for that first premise. Second premise, what lacks intelligence and moves toward an end is directed by a being with knowledge and intelligence. Conclusion, therefore some intelligent being, namely God, directs all natural things to their end. Well, how is that argument? Most people have thought, as it's stated, it's a pretty terrible argument. In fact, there's relatively little scholarly discussion of it, partly because people think it's so obvious what to say about it. Why? Well, take a look at that first premise. It says everything acts toward an end. All things without intelligence act toward an end. But that seems strange. Do neutrons act toward an end? If so, what are they up to? seems disturbing. What about other things? Electromagnetic fields, do they act toward an end? What about, oh, I don't know, let's say stars. Does a star act toward an end? What is that end? What are stars doing up there anyway? Well, we don't normally think of things that way, so that's a strange first premise. Now notice he does give us a sort of argument for it. He says, well, look, they're governed by natural law. They tend to always act in the same way and for the best result. Well, let's grant that the world is governed by a system of natural law so that things do move in the same way always, or he says nearly always. Frequently is actually what the Latin says. Okay, so these laws don't have to be absolutely universal and necessary. It would be fine from Aquinas' point of view for their to be statistical laws of nature, so we can't object on those grounds. But on the other hand, there are patterns, and those patterns, he says, are for the best. Well, there are patterns, but how would we know that they're for the best? Now here I think we have to think about the physics of Aristotle's, that goes on all the way from Aristotle's time up through Aquinas, and really remains in place more or less until the scientific revolution of the 17th century. In Aristotle's physics, things have a natural home. They do have an end. They're trying to go home. And it's sort of Wizard of Oz, like things are trying to go home. So let's take an example. Let's take a look at my cell phone. It has a home. Where is that home? I don't know, but it's down there. Look, it's trying to go there. <laughs> See, I drop it. Oh, yeah, I really drop it. And it keeps trying to go home. Well, where's its home? Somewhere near the center of the earth, I guess. Now, okay, we can think that way. And it was common for people to think that way for hundreds even, well, more than a millennium. But then, in Newtonian physics, we stopped thinking that way. We thought about laws of motion, for example. We thought about a law of gravitation. And Newton's law of gravitation doesn't talk about anything having a natural home or working toward an end. The gravitational force between two objects is the gravitational constant times the product of the masses of the objects over the distance between them squared. Well, there's no talk there of an end or a purpose or acting toward some goal or anything having a natural home. So it looks as if that kind of talk is completely misplaced. 
And indeed, after the scientific revolution, people tended to look at Aquinas's argument and say, ah, oh, well, it was based on a kind of Aristotelian understanding of the world that no longer applies, that we now understand really was misguided from the start. Now, I'm not sure that we should entirely give up on that. If we think about the general theory of relativity, for example, we're suddenly thrown back to something that makes Aquinas sound, well, not so implausible. After all, in the general theory of relativity, there isn't that kind of abstract action at a distance, as in Newton. Instead, well, really, there is no gravitational force at all. Gravity is a matter of something finding the shortest path in a curved space-time. But that's a little strange. The shortest path? That does sound something teleological-like. So it looks like they're acting for a purpose to find the shortest path. And indeed, in modern physics, there are various things that sound like that. In thermodynamics, you think about entropy increasing. Ah, it's as if the universe wants to become less orderly, wants to increase entropy. You might say, oh, it looks like it's acting for a purpose. And there are a variety of other places where it seems like things are doing that. So in short, we shouldn't think of the details of physical theory as entirely yet causing us to throw that first premise out. On the other hand, we should worry, because after all, this is again natural theology. We want these premises to be accessible to anyone thinking about ordinary experience of the world. We don't want it to depend on whether a Newtonian conception of gravitation or an Einsteinian gravitational theory is really, in the end, the correct physical theory. So let's move beyond the first premise. Things act toward an end. Now, that second premise seems pretty unmotivated, I think. Things that lack intelligence are directed by intelligent beings. Yes, the Archer example shows that. They quite often are. But now is everything like that? Are objects that are seeking the shortest path through a curved space-time directed by anyone aware and intelligent? I don't know what neutrons are doing, what they're up to, but whatever it is, is anyone intelligent directing them? Well, it can look like Aquinas is begging the question. The only candidate for telling neutrons what to do, for directing objects through a path at a curved space-time, is God. So if we mean, yes, there is such a being because God exists and is, in effect, directing things through then these curved space-time fields or other kinds of things, well, it looks like we're just begging the question, assuming the very thing we're trying to prove. So it's hard to say why we should accept premise two as well. But now, a more critical problem with the argument. Why should we assume that there's one intelligent being directing everything? After all, this archer directs that arrow. That archer directs that arrow. That pitcher throws that baseball. That quarterback throws that football. It doesn't look like there's any one person directing these objects. It looks like lots of different intelligent agents acting on a lot of different objects to move them and to cause them to act toward an end. The quarterback throws the ball toward the receiver. The pitcher throws the ball toward the catcher. Well, yes, <laughs> there is a purpose in all those cases, but there are different purposes, different goals, and different agents. So how do we get one agent that is responsible for everything? It looks like the argument moves from each thing having something that is directing it to, well, something that directs everything. That just seems like an illegitimate move. Now, there is a way of trying to correct this, of trying to fix it up. And some people have said, well, look at Aquinas' texts. If we look at the Latin, he says, omnes res naturales, all natural things. There's something that directs all natural things. And so we might think here he doesn't mean each and every natural thing. He means all of those things taken together. Omnes, or everything, <laughs> all natural things, we can take that in either a distributive or a collective sense. If we take it distributively, then yes, it seems implausible. The pitcher is the one who threw that ball, not God. <laughs> the quarterback threw that ball to the receiver, not God. Whatever is directing that neutron, well, it's whatever it is. Why should we assume it's God? It looks like there are many different intelligent beings directing many different things toward many different ends and we can't get them together. But if we deal with this collectively, we say, no, he means all natural things taken together, the entire natural world. Somebody's directing that toward an end, and that being is God. 
Now, it seems much more plausible. However, is that the solution? Well, we have to go back to our premises. We have to think now everything that is not aware and intelligent is directed towards some end. So we have to accept that the natural world as a whole is directed towards some end. And then that someone aware and intelligent is directing the entire natural world as a whole toward that end. Well, yes, if we accept those things, then the existence of God is very plausible. But why should we accept those things? It looks again as if this comes dangerously close to begging the question. If we don't start out believing in God, we're going to think, well, the world as a whole doesn't really have anyone directing it. It doesn't really act for any purpose. It's just doing what it does. Whatever it's doing, it's doing it now. <laughs> there is no purpose we can find. There is no meaning that it intrinsically has. And so we're likely to be left scratching our heads by Aquinas' argument. Well, once again, like the fourth way, I think there is something deeper going on in Aquinas' argument that depends on that Aristotelian argument. So we really have to go back to book two of Aristotle's Metaphysics to understand what Aquinas is up to here, how he's thinking about this. And once we do that, this actually, well, it is a kind of design argument, but it's going to look like it has a different kind of structure, and actually a structure that is, I think, in some ways, much more closely parallel to the first and second ways than is evident on the surface. So, is everything true of a proper part, true of the whole? If we think it must be, then we've got a way of going from each thing to everything, and maybe we can, save, we can save Aquinas. But if we doubt that, we think, well, here's one thing that's true of proper parts that isn't true of the whole. They're proper parts. Then we're going to be tempted to say, we can't do something like that. We have to find another path. But maybe there is one, and that's what we'll explore later.